arrived, and it, it sounds more uh, readable. The homebrew industrial revolution, um, a low impact manifesto or something. Um, and it, it's more a series of the sort of articles that he's written in C4SS and, and places like that. And I agree, he's, you know, um, very insightful about the ways in which the state, I mean, he's, he's, he's written two or three brilliant ones about um, BP and liability and, and, and so on in, in, in respect of the Gulf um, disaster, if, it's, if that's what it turns out to be, I'm assuming. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we can all have different ideas about what comes out the other end. I don't get the, imp I mean, he won't travel, he, he won't fly, for example. I mean, we asked, I think we asked whether he wanted to come and speak at a Libertarian Alliance conference, and he said, no, I don't fly, um, and things like that. And he doesn't have a, I mean, well, he might just be scared of flying, I don't know. I mean, I, we can offer him a blue ribbon line trip then or something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, but he also, you know, nobody, there's, there's no known photographs of him. No, you know. I mean, and, and that's a, you know, that's a bit of a standing, standing joke even amongst that sort of group in the C4SS. Um, they keep producing different photographs of different anarchists and calling them Kevin Cobbs. But, so, I, you know, I mean, so the music site has got a, oddly enough, the music site has got a strange uh, photograph of David Steele. <laughs> and it's not him. Oh. <laughs> it's most certainly not him. He's got silver hair and looks completely different. You know? But, uh, so but you I, 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 certainly when, um, when you engage him on the mailing list and one-to-one and, -one and so on, um, that isn't a side that he pushes. That is far more important to get rid of the state than to have some kind of image of what happens afterwards. I mean, he's postulating a sort of preferred option, but real, you know, I think probably realizes that in order to um, to achieve that preferred option, he might have to go and live in Nebraska or something. Isn't it showing some principle not to fly? <laughs> This is always the fine job with these dreams. They're oh, yeah. Green, yeah. green, 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 but they're flying all around the world for these conferences. It should have been more visible if you walked. Yes, that's right. Is there any other questions? I sadly shared an administration yeah. with the Greens. Oh, sorry, I was wandering around because it's labelled Oh, right, yeah, 13, so I, you know, I got lost as well. Yeah. I've heard if you've got a Lex, the Lex system in the UK. Uh, well, I sort of briefly touched on it as one of those kind of sub gray, you know, gray market economy type structures that is part of, is what mutualism seeks to use as a way to sort of subvert the state. Um, and yeah, I mean, one of, one of the projects that I was, well, I still am trying to, trying to get off the ground, although the urgency seems to, for now, have abated, is, is a, an alternative, uh, uh, um, a credit union for small businesses, if you see what I mean, a, a credit circle, like um, there's one in, one based in Basel that was established in the 30s depression by, uh, by followers of Silvio Gessel, um, who was a libertarian, called himself a libertarian socialist was, um, and wrote the natural economic order or something. And one, one of his, I mean, it's very similar to um, the um, Josiah, um, William Baxter de Green's idea of mutual banking as a way of breaking the oligopoly of, of state sanctioned money issuers. Um, I was quite surprised how big they are. There's one that I was uh, into, so I was doing this uh, radio show about it. Oh, it's like a new Moray net system. It's 36,000 trades. Where, where, based where? All oh, right, okay. I wonder if that might be part, that might be a guy that, there's a guy who used to be compliance officer at the 
International Petroleum Exchange here and was and was um, Chris Cook is the is the guy from here who took this idea up north. I mean, there's there's a there's Jeremy Perrin and this Stuart somebody who set up this scheme. All right, okay. So yeah. I was quite surprised that they had actually you know, 36,000 trades so far using this sort of technology. Yeah. So it was quite interesting. Yeah, I mean. You know, looking at alternate mechanisms, I mean, a, a very large proportion of international trade is done on, on effectively on barter. Um, I mean, my old man used to import buses into, Mercedes buses into Nigeria, and cash never changed hands, because, you know, Nigeria had oil, and, and Brazil had Mercedes buses, um, but it was impossible to get letters of credit and so on timed by government officials, so you, you, did, you did the deal in a tanker went one way and a, and a container ship with buses came the other, you know, and uh, they'd say 25% of global trade is, is done in barter. Um, David? If you did a, a list of the respects in which, the ways in which left libertarian mutualists pulled them together at the moment, differed in terms of doctrine or theory from what you might call right anarchists. I was just trying to do it in my head. We've got intellectual property, we probably more or less agree about patents, we might not agree about copyrights, that's one effort. Maybe. Tax and tariff, we probably agree about across the board. Mm -hmm. There's probably no point mm -hmm. of distinction there. Land, I don't quite know what the left libertarians would do about land ownership in a, in a free market, so I'm left guessing there. And then money and banking, well, we probably more or less all agree that the desirable state of affairs is free banking without any state involvement. Yeah. So if, if, if you take those four, the only one where I can really detect a significant point of difference is the copyright on one side is possibly land. I don't quite know what the... And I'm not, and I'm not sure. I mean, when, um, when you read Ethics of Liberty, for example, when I mean, Rothbard does make the point that some kind of coercive mechanism may be needed in those countries that have had a feudal history and that so much injustice is already embedded in, in, in the ownership structure. I mean, he talks in terms of Latin America, places like that. You know. um, but, I mean, he doesn't... I mean, for a start, I'm pretty sure that having tried to glean what I can from their various criticisms of Georgism, for example, that they don't understand Georgism the same way as Georgists do. I mean, I, I know that's maybe uh, an obvious thing to say, but I can understand, for example, because they see it as a property tax, and without paying that property tax, you would lose your property because there would be some coercive body waiting to take it away from you. Um, I can see how that alters homesteaded ownership. Um, but it's also not true that Georgists think of that in terms of removing ownership from the from the owner. And I think obviously at the point where you default on your on your sort of obligation, then there, then you take then you you may. Take for example, this country, you know, you've got millions and millions and millions of people who like to believe that they own their own home. Yeah. Well, that's left libertarian world, and the burgers of the world are all going to lose their houses, or what? What, what is the left libertarian? Why would they? Position? Because they're all leaseholders. Why? Why might as well help? I mean, what's the extent to which, in a left libertarian world, there will be a sort of whole-scale uh, reallocation or uh, disputing of yeah. existing land titles as they exist now? No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it. I don't think it would. Um, what What you may. 
I mean, for a start, there would be um, 15% of domestic property suddenly freed up from state or quasi-state ownership in the form of housing associations and council houses. 